Okay, this first one is, what is the rapture? Is it in the Bible? It's interesting because most of these questions were on wisdom, but that one was, I thought, well, should I stick it at the back or stick it at the front? So I thought, well, wisdom says stick it at the front. So <laughs> there it is. Um, the Greek word raptura comes from a passage in 1 Thessalonians 4 where Paul says, But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them that are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also who sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. But this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him and the Lord uh, to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord and then he says which is the best part wherefore comfort each other right with these words and so the Greek word raptura is just the word that means to be caught up together with the Lord in the air when he comes and so uh, that's the where the word rapture comes from and is in in the Bible it's in first Thessalonians 4 uh, verse if you want to know the verse on that where it says caught up is the Greek word in verse 17 so raptura all right uh, can you offer some encouragement to single divorced moms whether their children are young in the home or grown and out of the house um, I think what you're asking is that you're, you're the single divorced moms, whether your children are in the home, okay, or out of the house. Um, I'm not sure what, what it is that you're wanting. I, this is one of those questions that'd be nice to have more specifics, but I think the thing I would counsel is to do the next thing. I've always uh, loved Elizabeth Elliot's quote, if you don't know what to do, which actually is from Amy Carmichael, then do the next thing. Uh, Get involved in serving others so that you don't nurse your wounds uh, as a divorce or a single. Get involved in the body life of the, of the church. Remember those days that are difficult. What the Bible says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And uh, I think that's with any uh, situation. I know that uh, during COVID-19, I was, uh, even though we're still in it, but there was about a week that I just was overcome with sorrow. And I'm not a depressed person, but... I was just like, well, thank the Lord for the morning. <laughs> Joy comes in the morning and, you know, just keep doing the next thing. And uh, so that it was very helpful. Uh, should they desire or pursue to remarry or give themselves over to remain and serve as single? Uh, that's the question on should divorced women, single women, I guess that's what you're asking, should they desire or pursue to remarry or give themselves over to remain and serve as single? Well, the Bible in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 5, Paul says that he wishes the young widows marry, bear children, rule the house, give no occasion for the adversary to speak reproachfully. And then he says if those young wind widows, and he defines them in the previous uh, verses, 60, 60 and younger is a, wit is a young widow. Uh, so if you're 60 and over, you don't have to get remarried. But if you're 60 and younger, in fact, my husband used to get after Debbie all the time. You need to get married. You need to get married. Well, now she's almost 70. She goes, I don't have to get married anymore. I'm an old widow. So uh, young widows, they marry, they bear children, give no occasion for the adversary to speak reproachfully. And then he goes on to say for the reason why, because some have already turned aside to Satan. And they go around from house to house speaking things they ought not to speak. So they were getting idle because uh, they weren't married. And so uh, it would be, according to the Bible, wise if you could find a godly husband to get married. Uh, but again, you know, I would certainly be very careful. Marry in the Lord only. Um, and make sure that, uh, you know, divorces are biblical. Remarriage is biblical. There's a lot of... Uh, Jay Adams has a good book called Marriage, Divorce, and Remarriage that kind of spells out all the ifs and where's and what's about that. Uh, could, you, could you please speak a little about how we can walk in wisdom in the world and the church in regard to the social justice movement, which has infiltrated both spaces? Um, I'm not an expert on this, so I'm probably not the person to ask, but I would say that I am very concerned about the social justice movement in the sense that it has uh, redefined the gospel, which I think is very serious. According to Galatians 6, if anyone preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. 
And again, Paul says, I say unto you again, if anybody preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. So the gospel of Jesus Christ is very clear. The gospel is Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again according to the scriptures. And does the gospel change the heart, our nature, to where we want to have justice? Of course it does. Do we want to minister to the poor? Of course it does. The gospel changes our heart. But the gospel, uh, my concern is that we're changing the nature of the gospel. Um, if you know anything, and this, this kind of goes into it, but anything about what truth, um, not truth matters, what Black Matters Live stands for, if you know their premise, if you know what they believe, that is not anything a Christian can endorse uh, with a clear and good conscience. And uh, this issue of being entitled, you know, I'm entitled uh, to this and that and the other. Uh, well, Eve thought that too, you know. I'm entitled. Give me that fruit. And look what happened. So, ladies, no, but none of us are entitled to anything, right? We're entitled to depravity and hell, but God in his mercy saved us. So I, another thing I, I am very concerned about the movement is how it is destroying churches. There's that envy, strife, confusion. And I would say that is not of the Lord. That is not of the Lord. So um, I've been actually, uh, I went to the Truth Matters Conference last year, and they give out those bracelets, you know, those rubber bracelets. And it's aqua, and it's really black, bold letters, Truth Matters. So I've been wearing it out because if people go, what is are you Black Lives Matter? I go, no, it says truth matters. Well, what does that mean? Oh, well, it's truth that matters, right? So let's talk about truth. And so it's a good gospel, you know, opening. And Debbie's been wearing her ball cap. Debbie, can you hear me? You got it? Bring it in here. My husband designed these ball caps. If you want to order one, you can. I shouldn't be saying that, but uh, <laughs> here she comes. So last Sunday, he wore his up in the pulpit just for a brief moment. But uh, so this is a good gospel tool. Make America great, fear God. <laughs> so, tell, tell them what happened, Debbie. She wore that the other day. Tell them what happened. She was thinking about wearing it on the plane today, but <laughs> we could get a mask that says that, you know, make America great, fear God. So yeah, just do it. Yeah. So anyway, so that's cute. But anyway, that's been a good gospel thing. Okay. What do you believe biblical and appropriate leadership, headship and submission looks like in a courtship? How would you distinguish those roles in courtship versus in a marriage? Uh, well, in courtship, from what I understand about courtship, the, the daughter is still under the father's authority until she gets married. And then after she's married, she's under the authority of her husband. Uh, we didn't hold to any of those things. I mean, we were very careful with our children. Uh, my daughter dated a guy whose parents believed in courtship, so that's how they went through their process. And so um, we respected that and went along with that. That's what they wanted to do. But our daughter was still under our authority until she got married to him. And our son, he didn't date anyone until he became a senior at uh, seminary. So, uh, but we had her come to Oklahoma for two weeks without our son. So we could get to know her. And uh, then her parents had him fly out to Seattle where they lived at the time for three months. <laughs> found him a job, found him someone in the church to work for, and so they could watch his work ethic and everything before they would give their blessing for the marriage. So I, we, weren't, we weren't disinterested or disactive in our children's dating and courtshiping. So very much hands-on. Uh, in fact, my husband had a sit-down, come-to-Jesus meeting with my daughter's now husband said, you either marry my daughter or, you know, quit, quit, day, quit this five-year stuff, you know, move on with it. So uh, he talks about that often, how he, the poor guy didn't even eat his dinner. <laughs> he was like, <laughs> so anyway, um, but under the authority of the father until she marries. Uh, and, I, and again, if I'm not answering the question, ask me more later. Book suggestion for someone whose husband's committed adultery and is repentant. Uh, Putting Your Past in Its Place by Steve Byers, I would recommend that. Trusting God by Jerry Bridges, I would recommend that. Uh, Maximum Impact by Wayne Mack, it's a great book on 1 Corinthians 13. 
loaded with questions. Uh, and then Faith and Feelings, How to Cultivate Godly Emotions by Brian Borgman. Uh, there's a one section in there where a woman comes to her husband and, and it's a true story. And she said, um, I just want you to know I've committed adultery and I need to ask your forgiveness. And her husband turned around and said, I forgive you. He said, I've sinned against God more in one day than you have against me with this act of adultery. Now that's a, that's a pretty mature man, isn't it? So it's a book now I'm using a lot in discipleship and counseling. It's probably on my top list of one of my favorites, uh, Faith and Feelings, uh, How to Cultivate Godly Emotions. It starts out with God and how he is emotional, he's compassionate, he's angry, but his emotions are controlled and therefore ours should be controlled. And so it's a very, very good help for discipling and counseling. Uh, Susan, I became saved and I feel my heart is split open. As a non-believer, I did not love too many people. I outright hated most people, but was able to hide such hate. Now I'm a Christian, my heart feels so much love, Sometimes it hurts so much when I see my brothers hurt. My heart is so heavy. Will this eventually lessen over time? I hope not. <laughs> I, would, I wish I give me some of what you got. <laughs> you know, I would definitely say I don't know you, but you have the gift of mercy. Definitely, you have the gift of mercy, uh, and you're probably an encourager. You know, Barnabas, the son of consolation, a comforter. So uh, weep with those who weep. Now you don't want to get to the point where you enable. Come. Uh, Coming with the gift of mercy can come enabling if you're not careful. And so with all the spiritual gifts, we have propensities to uh, things that maybe are not godly. So that would definitely want to be under control. But um, unless this prevents you from performing your responsibilities at home and wherever else, I would say that it's a blessing from God that you really can enter in and empathize with those who are hurting. Um, what are the marks of a mature Christian woman? Likewise, what are the, some signs of immaturity? Well, we went through those in James. Those were very clear. The marks of a mature Christian woman or one who's called by God and one who's not. Titus 2 also gives them. An older woman must uh, likewise have behavior that becomes holiness. In other words, she's set apart. Uh, she must not be given over to wine, to slander, gossip, any of those things. And her behavior is to be good and she's to be a teacher of good things. That would be a sign of a mature woman. Also that she loves her husband, she loves her children, she's pure, she's a keeper at home, good and obedient to her own husband. That would be a sign of a mature woman. Uh, Proverbs 31, uh, that woman who uh, respects her husband, she uh, is a hard worker, gets up early, goes to bed late, you know, she's industrious, she uh, is not afraid of the future. There's so many great things about that Proverbs 31 woman. I think that would be a sign of maturity. And then, as I said, our session in James. Um, Susan, in light of Titus 2, how do you practically get started if you are the mature older woman? Do you ask a young woman to come over for coffee and talk about spiritual things? For you, is it a weekly event that you meet up with young women? How long does the discipleship usually last? Um, I do both ways. I have often approached women and asked them if they would like to be discipled. And I've also had women come to me and ask me if I would disciple them. So I've done it both ways. Sometimes I pursue, I see a woman, she's got great potential and nobody's pouring into her. In fact, we have all these new people in our church that have just uh, been regenerated. And I was telling my husband the other day, I said, there's a couple young couples, they need to be discipled, they're new Christians. And so sometimes we pursue, sometimes they pursue us. Um, and, you know, just begin to talk and share and, and see what her needs are. And, and that helps me know what direction to go with her. A weekly event, um, most of the women I personally disciple, it's every other week. Some are every week. Uh, some are once a month, um, depending on their schedule, my schedule, and how long does it last? Well, <laughs> I'm still working with some women that I've worked with for 20 years, so I don't know. I, I I rarely, I don't think I've ever kicked anybody out of the nest. It just naturally has happened. And some of them just leave after certain things. You know, they cuss me out or hang up on the phone. And that's the end of that discipling relationship. But uh, move away or they end up in, you know, somewhere else. And th just things happen. So I just trust the Lord in that. But uh, if you've never been discipled or discipled anyone, you should do it. It's a great joy and uh, it's definitely a growing uh, means of grace that God has provided for us. Uh, what are some scripture words of wisdom you can give me for dealing with loss, a miscarriage, 
and family loss. Uh, a miscarriage, Safe in the Arms of God by John MacArthur is very good, and Losing a Child. Um, I would immerse yourself in the Psalms. Um, I know I've just got done with Psalms in my daily reading and now in Proverbs, and I tell you, the Psalms have been such a blessing during this crazy time in our world, and they've been such a comfort. So uh, definitely I would immerse yourself in the Psalms. I'd memorize Psalm 42 and 43. Uh, I would read Trusting God by Jerry Bridges excellent book on uh, trusting God when life is difficult. Um, so that would be, there's also another book written by Al Martin. Uh, does anybody know the name of it? It's on when uh, you lose a loved one. Anybody know the name of it? Grieving and Solace or something like that. Uh, anyway, it's very good. I can't think of the name of it, but by Al Martin. Uh, how much is too much praise regarding your children? How do I raise a humble girl? I might uh, overpraise my only child. Um, I think you know it's too much praise when they start becoming arrogant, sassy, proud. But I also would be very careful. When I said earlier that you need to praise your children, I don't think you should go around just, you know, always. I think you need to give glory to God when you praise your children. You know, honey, what you just did was so great. I'm so glad you went over and talked to Grandma and gave her a hug. You know, God is so good to give you that sensitivity to go and talk to your Grandma. Let's just thank God that he has given you that desire to be kind to your Grandma. Always bring God into the picture. You don't want to give the child glory. Give God the glory for creating that desire in your child to do the right thing. So I would always point them back to God because, you know, Paul says, God forbid that I should glory in my flesh. We do, however, have the passage that says that we're not to praise our own lips, but let another man praise you. And so there's nothing wrong with, you know, thanking your child for doing the right thing. Or, you know, God has really gifted you to, uh, you know, understand English. Or you're, you sure are good with arithmetic. God has really, you know, blessed you in this and learning how to add and subtract. And so I would definitely um, bring it back to the Lord. Um, I have no, okay, this is a, this is a question I didn't want to really uh, present here, but it had to do with an intimate relationship with the husband. And my answer to this question would be uh, intended for pleasure by Dr. Wheat, who is a Christian doctor. So uh, it was just a question about in the bedroom, so I didn't want to ask it in uh, mixed, I mean, in not a mixed audience, but a, this audience of this uh, different ages. So uh, Intended for Pleasure by Dr. Wheat, a great book on, uh, and it's from a Christian perspective that will help you in the question that you ask here. Um, Matthew, okay, I struggle with knowing when to either stop or not start or change strategies when witnessing for Christ. Do you have any wisdom to impart? Um, yes, I think we talked a little bit about this. Be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. Uh, don't give holy things to dog. Neither cast your pearls before swine, unless you want to be lacerated. So if they start to become angry, I would withdraw for a while. You know, if you look at Jesus and his family, there were times he was very into them, and there were times he pulled away. In fact, when they said, your mother and your brother are outside, they're wanting to talk to you. And what did he say? These are my brothers. These are my sisters. You know, this is my mother's. And so he had times of intensity with them, and he had times where he pulled away from them. So you need to pray. Ask God for wisdom. Uh, as I mentioned about my sister, you know, I've, she's, been, uh, she's been moved to Oklahoma now for, I think, about five years. And I've had off and on times where we've had really good conversations about the gospel, and right now is one of those times. And then there's other times she doesn't want to hear it. And so I don't. I don't force that. I don't give holy things to dogs. But those times that she's uh, sensitive to it, I, I definitely uh, hone in on that and share with her. Uh, what are some good, reliable news podcasts or radio stations? None. Uh, I don't know. If any. I really don't. Uh, you know, I was thinking about this question. Depraved men can only speak, you know, depraved things, right? I, I really... In fact, my husband is a, he loves news. And I finally, you know, through this whole thing, I was like, I can watch one hour. That's about it. One hour, I'm done. So then I say, I'm going to go read or I'm going to go do something else. Because uh, they're all, I don't know who's telling the truth. 
Every day the news is different. Wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Go outside, don't go outside, you know. Uh, go check on your loved ones, but don't go to the nursing home. So I'm like, well, what, what do you believe anymore? So um, I limit. Um, I read the news every day. I know what's going on in the world, but I don't, I don't spend a lot of time watching the news. I think it's just, it's just disheartening and makes me discouraged, and I don't, want, I don't think that's from the Lord. So, um, but my husband does like news, and so we, I know enough to be able to intelligently talk to him. He'll go, did you hear that, da 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 I go, yes, I already heard. I already heard. I came across on my news feed, and sometimes I find out before him, honey, did you hear what? He goes, really? I, in fact, I call him. I said, did you hear about uh, the Supreme Court? They voted that half of Oklahoma now. Well, did you guys, I bet you didn't know this since I've been here. The Supreme Court, half of Oklahoma is now belongs to Indian territory reservation. So it means where I live is no longer under the state of Oklahoma. We now belong. So my husband, I said, what does this mean for us? He said, well, we're probably going to lose our property. I mean, we're going to, you know, pro everything because it really belongs to the Indians. So anyway, I might move to Florida. So <laughs> no, for real, because what? When we saw that was coming up before the Supreme Court, this is the big Supreme Court, I said, what are we going to do? He said, Doug said, we'll have to move because we'll no longer be under the jurisdiction of the government of Oklahoma. We'll be under Indian jurisdiction. So I don't know what this means for us. It just happened while I was here. So uh, I, don't, I really don't know if anybody does know a reliable news uh, podcast or radio station. I really do not. Um, my husband is very learned in this, so I really trust what he says and listens to. He's very discerning, but just remember the wisdom of this world is foolishness. So I want to know what's going on, but even in knowing what's going on, how do we know that's what's really going on? You know, I met yesterday with a gal for lunch who's not here, but uh, she's in the medical field, and she said, we were talking about the amount of COVID cases, and she said, well, let me tell you what it is. A lot of it is you get tested, you're positive, and you get tested two weeks later, and you're positive, so you count as another case. And she said, there's no way you can really know. And so how do we know what we're hearing is really true or not, you know? So it's, uh, I'm thankful to know the God of all truth, aren't you? Amen. This is true. So uh, I've just found myself spending more time in the Word, more time reading good good books, spending more time outside, uh, being more with God's people during this time, because that's where I'm really encouraged. It's not, not listening to news. But if anyone does know a good news or a good podcast, just yell it out, because I really don't. Anybody, anybody know one? I kind of like Joy FM because it keeps you uplifted with Joy FM. Music. And I don't know if anybody still does Al Mohler, the briefing. Is that still good? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I know he, I, I, I just don't have time for all that, but I know at some point he did try to. If you also want to um, watch, um, I know from a military perspective, if you want to watch um, news, it's called Newsmax. Um, it's on TV. The one that's always struck closest to the truth, and I use closest like as a <laughs> relative term, is Fox. Yeah, that's the one my husband watches, but. Anyway, foxy, foxy they are. Okay. Ugh. Take that out for the YouTube now. Yeah, so my, the lady that does my YouTube channel, she said, one of your recent subscribers is YouTube content. And I said, what does that mean? She says, that means they're watching you. And if you say anything that they don't like, they're going to take you down. I said, well, so be it. Whatever. I don't care. Um, what would you recommend someone to do if they have a desire to become a counselor? I memorize the word. I will honestly say, when I became certified with uh, national, well, it used to be NANC, now it's ACBC, it really wasn't difficult to go through the training uh, because of my uh, diligence in, in learning the word of God. And so I would say, I mean, you can go through the uh, a certification, National Association of Certified Biblical Counselors. It is excellent training. You can go to their conferences. Uh, they're having one this October, Lord willing. I don't know. We haven't heard if it's going to be canceled at uh, MacArthur's church. Um, so I would go through the training if you want. But I would say the best word to be a good, the best way to be a biblical counselor is to know the Word of God, and uh, it's really better than any counseling materials or books. Even though those are helpful, I, like I'm very helpful. Uh, hope, I'm very encouraged when I go and there's like Christian medical doctors that are speaking and tell us about the different drugs that are out there now and the dangers of them. And 
you know, things like that, things I can't get from scripture, but so those types of things are very, very helpful. And I, I do go to all the conferences, usually speak at them, but, um, and I would say that ACBC is, is really good training. And we now have a really good director, Dale Johnson. He is, in fact, last, yes, last year or the year before, I mean, life is going so fast anymore, but the first time he took over, I, I mean, he took such a strong stand on some issues. And I went up to him right after, and I said, yes, you know. So, insufficiency and authority of scripture. Okay, what is the proper way for a single woman to be submissive? I was told by past elders that a single woman that I need to be submissive to the elders of the church. Well, we all should be submissive to the elders in the sense of what Hebrews 13, 7 says. Obey them that have the rule over you. Why? Because they watch for your soul and they're going to give account on that day. And Paul says, let him do that with joy and not with grief. That's unprofitable for you. So we are to submit to the elders. Now, the submission only comes in, thus says the Lord. My husband has often said, don't come and ask me about investing. Don't come and ask me about, you know, which house to buy or whatever. His authority is only based on what God's word says. Uh, so, but I mean, people do ask him his advice on other things. And we try to give counsel in those areas. But outside of the scriptures, that's where uh, an elder or pastor's uh, authority really stops. Um, I mean, you can always go ask him, hey, I'm thinking about buying a car and you know, what do you think on this? But, you know, the Bible doesn't really say, you know, which car you should buy. So, uh, but we are all to be submissive to those that are uh, under our, we're under their authority. In fact, with the Master Ministries is under the authority of the elders of our church. And so that way it keeps us from being a parachurch organization. We're under the umbrella of them. And so that's for my safeguard. Um... What is the name of the song you closed with in session three? It's called A Christian Home. Oh, give us homes. And did you get the woman's name? I gave it to you. Barbara Hart. Barbara Hart, written in 1965. Please give information on your upcoming online conference. Uh, it's called Open Hearts in a Closed World. I'm just one of five plenary speakers. I will actually be doing mine on Tuesday morning. And you can get on my website. It's on the front page, right, Debbie? Yeah, with, with themaster.org, and it's right there on the front page, and you can click that on, and it'll take you to the link for the online conference. My teenager seems to take any form of critis... Okay, let me repeat. My teenager seems to take any form of correction as criticism. How can I tell if I'm being too harsh or nagging? Should I be using their response as an indication? Um, the best way to find out if you're being too harsh or nagging is maybe have someone evaluate you. Uh, ask your husband if you're married. Ask somebody else in the home. I remember when my husband, when my, my daughter, I think she was around five or six, he said, uh, Susan, he said, this home is like military. I mean, you ever treat everything like a military? And I was like, what are you talking about? And so we had a birthday party for my son and uh, they videoed it. And I remember watching it years later and I'm like, oh my goodness, I really do <laughs> run this home like the mill and do this, do that. And I can still see little Cindy, she's five years old, come to the kitchen, go, mommy, can I help you with the birthday cake? And I said, no, go sit down. And I'm like, oh my goodness. And uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't a believer then and I'm not excusing it, but it was when he said that to me, you're running this house like the military. I, I was totally oblivious to that. I didn't know what he was talking about. And then I saw that video and I was like, oh my goodness, that's horrible. And uh, I wished I could go back and say, of course, honey, you can help me. I mean, what in the world? So I think somebody else evaluating you might ask them, am I too harsh? Uh, have you noticed that about me? And ask your husband, maybe ask a friend. Uh, and I wouldn't necessarily use their response as an indication because, you know, kids like to manipulate. So uh, make sure that, you know, you ask somebody else. What is your YouTube channel? Uh, Susan Heck with the Master is the YouTube channel. Uh, and I'm sorry, I do not know what the second part of this question is. I think good resources for someone courting. I don't know what it says. So, yeah, if, if I, I, sorry can't read your handwriting, but that's okay. I can't read my own handwriting. I keep a planner, and sometimes I look, I go, what am I supposed to do today? I can't even read what I'm supposed to do. So, 
but you can email me. In response to the responsibility of the parents to the children, how would you apply this to teachers? Um, I'm not sure what you're asking, but I would definitely, as a teacher, um, you can't demand the kids, but I would expect a th I would expect obedience and that you're the authority figure. However, in our world, you know, everybody makes an A, everybody's good, everybody, you know, the public school system is in a mess. So I don't know how you would apply this to teachers. No wonder people are getting out of the teaching field. But uh, certainly it's very, I mean, I remember as a little girl growing up, I was in public school, I was, I would have been terrified to disobey my teacher. And, uh, <clears throat> but now, now they'll just tell them what to do and Take a gun and shoot them. I don't know. It's just crazy. But if that's what you're asking, I don't know. If you're asking me something different, then email me or text me or call me or whatever me. Uh, how do you discipline children four and six without spanking them if you cannot spank them? <clears throat> well, I'm not sure why you can't spank them. Um, my daughter had four adopt has four adopted children from Africa. And they were uh, living in Kentucky when they got, they already had one from uh, Uganda, and then they adopted three from Rwanda. And they adopted them while they were in Kentucky. And of course, they had to be overseen by the Department of Human Services or whatever you call that. So they came for weekly visits. And I asked Cindy, how are you handling this? Because they did discipline their children, even though it says you're not supposed to. And she said, the social worker came in and she said, what are you doing for, to correction? She said, we spank, we spank our kids. And I said, did you ever get in trouble? She said, no, I never did. She said, mom, we're not gonna lie. And we're gonna parent our kids God's way. So that's one way you could do it. You could do it, you know, you, you need to be obedient to the Lord over your obedient to governing authorities. So I, if it was me, and this is me, I would discipline my children. I would obey God over governing authorities. And uh, we are to obey God over man. So, um, you know, if I, I'll tell you what I did in the nursery one time. Debbie will be horrified, but I've already told her this. <laughs> but because I couldn't, you know, you can't spank in the church nursery, but I was working in the nursery, and one little boy, I mean, he was out of control. So I just went over to him. And I took his arm and put my fingers in, and I said, I am Josiah's grandmother. And I spanked really hard. And he was like, ooh. <laughs> so I didn't tell him I was going to spank him. And boy, he was good the rest of the hour. So, but now we have a call system. We call the parents, and they come and get them. But, but I don't know. I definitely, I mean, if you're really, uh, I would do it God's way, but if that's, you know, intimidating to you, I would definitely have some form of taking away privileges. I, I would not do time out, but I would, I would make some, some form of discipline that would hurt. And I don't mean physical, but hurt them in some way. Take away privileges, take away toys, take away screen time, whatever it is that I always tell women, what your child loves most, take it away, <laughs> take it away and, uh, and take it away for a long time until they straighten up. Is it okay for women to pray in church service if your pastor asks you to during a Sunday school class? Is it okay for women to answer and comment during the class? Well, Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, as we looked at last night, that women are to pray in like manner without wrath and doubting. 1 Corinthians 11, talk about a woman praying with her head covered, her, her head uncovered. She should pray with her head covered. So both of those are talking about the public assembly. Um, so if you want to look at it biblically, no. Uh, do we do it in our church? No, I've never known for my husband to call on a woman to pray, except for we have Wednesday night prayer meeting where men and women come and we all pray, but it's just a prayer meeting. I personally, just me, this is outside Bible, I personally would feel very awkward praying in the public assembly with men present, but that's just me. Um, but biblically, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, study it, 1 Timothy 2, um, I, I don't know. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know of any churches, very many churches that do that, but I, yeah. And as far as a Sunday school class, is it okay for women to answer and comment during the class? If the teacher opens it up for questions and answers, yes. I think it's just fine. But, uh, but she shouldn't be challenging the Sunday school teacher. After he asks, answers the question, I wouldn't get into a debate with him. I remember a couple years ago, I 
challenged a Sunday school teacher, and um, I asked a question that I challenged, and I, I was very convicted. I was like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And so I, I, I can't remember if I went back and asked for forgiveness, but I know I felt, I told Doug, I said, I shouldn't have done that. That was very, that shouldn't have done that, especially in a public setting like that. So, um, but I do think, yes, you know, and again, I'm not the authorities in this church or wherever you go to church, so if your elders and your authorities believe something different, you need to yield to them, okay? Uh, being a fairly new Christian, I have a desire to do missions. How will I know when and where the Lord will use me? How will I know if this is the plan the Lord has for me? Pray about it. Uh, ask, if you're married, ask your, I don't say you're not married, ask your husband, ask your father if you're not married, what he thinks, know what your spiritual gifts are. Uh, pray and ask the Lord for guidance. I think about Paul often in the scriptures, he said the door was open, the door was closed. So I would pray and ask God to open shut doors according to his will for your life. Um, but if that's a desire you have of your heart, I imagine the Lord is leading you in that direction to go into the mission field. But I wouldn't know, I don't know God's will for your life. Certainly pray, I'd fast and pray uh, about it. Also get others to pray with you. Uh, please give examples of meekness, strength under control. I'm not sure a lot of Christian women understand this. Um, I think I explained it pretty good in one of the last sessions. It's not um, weakness, not weakness, uh, meekness, or it's not weakness, it's not passivity, it's not Mickey Mouse. It's strength under control. So your husband comes home and says, Honey, we're moving to New York City. New York City, are you out of your mind? Don't you know, you know? I would say, really, honey, uh, New York City? Why do you want to move there? I mean, is there some reason you want to move there? And then talk about it. Um, and, you know, when you're confronting your husband, and we talked about that, and I, it's a, I give some examples in the little booklet, uh, Speaking the Truth in Love, um, how to confront your husband, how to confront people. And, ladies, you want to do it with meekness, which is strength under control. You don't compromise Scripture not even with your husband, but you have it, you do it with all authority and with all respect. And I think I've told you this in past times that uh, when I first got saved, I didn't do it very well. I'd go into my husband's office and I'd be like this, you know, and then it didn't go well with him when I approached him in that manner. But I finally learned, you know, how to respectfully disagree and have strength under control. So one day I went in and needed to talk to him about something that was troubling me. And when I left his office, he said, Susan, thank you for the rebuke and thank you for how you did it. So I finally learned it, but it took, <laughs> listen, it took a lot of mistakes and uh, I didn't do it right for a long time. But uh, I, you know, your husband wants a strong woman. He really does. I think my husband appreciates that I'm, I'm bold and I'm willing to do the right thing, but that should be under control with all respect and submission. Uh, top three things. How can we encourage our unconverted adult children? First thing I thought of was live it. Live it. Be an example to your unconverted adult children that you really live out Christianity. Secondly, I would speak the truth in love to them. Uh, speak the truth in love to them. And then thirdly, I would let them know you love them often. I love you. I would let them know you pray for them often. I think that would be an encouragement. But live it. Live your Christian life. Um, how do we handle things rightly when we are, when your husband speaks to you unlovingly and harsh? And I think you're saying uh, when your husband that says he's converted <clears throat> speaks to you unlovingly and in a harsh tone. Um, <clears throat> if it just happens once, I would probably overlook it. If it continues, it's a habit of his to speak to you unloving or in a harsh tone, I would again go to him in meekness, strength under control, and say to him something like this, Honey, I've been noticing lately that your tone of voice with me has been unloving and that you're uh, speaking in harsh tones. And, you know, the scriptures are clear about our speech. It's to be encouraging. It's to be edifying. It's to be kind. And um, I'm very concerned that you've gotten in the 
in a sinful habit of speaking to me like that and then just see how it goes. Uh, if he continues to get like that or this makes him more angry and he continues to be unloving and becomes more and more harsh uh, after a reasonable amount of time, I would probably uh, ask a pastor or elder to come to your home and then I would confront him in front of that pastor or that elder say, I've been trying to talk to my husband now for months about his harsh tone of voice. He's very unloving. It's getting worse and I need help. And uh, so hopefully there's, you know, hopefully wouldn't have to go further than that. But um, I would lovingly do that. Now, I will say there was a time in my life um, that I would pray about something for six weeks before I would go and talk to my husband about it. Because a lot of times in those six weeks, it works itself out. So, but now we just don't have that many issues, you know, because I finally got redeemed. And uh, so, you know, I've learned how to walk with my husband in harmony. So, but I used to have a policy. I'm not going to go and talk to him about this for six weeks. I'm going to pray about it for six weeks. And uh, usually I'd find the Lord just worked it out. He just, you know, it's amazing what you do, what God does when you get on your knees and pray. <laughs> Ask God to change your husband, you know, and uh, to help him with that. But that's how I would talk to him. Um, my husband is too harsh with my children, often provoking them to anger and resentment. It's heartbreaking watching them become more and more angry and seeing their joy diminish. How does a godly woman submit to her husband in this situation when she always feels the need to protect her children? I give the same counsel I just gave to the person before. Um, but I also would let him know what's happening to the children. Honey, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the children are angry. They're discouraged. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed they're not happy anymore. And this really, I don't know if this, this husband's a Christian or not. This person doesn't say. Uh, if, if he's a Christian, I would definitely confront him several times. I would bring it to a matter before the elders. I would, Matthew, as Matthew 18 says, if he doesn't repent, you bring one or two more. If they don't listen to them, then you tell it to the church. And so this is, I mean, anger is a sin worthy of hellfire. Paul's very clear about that in Galatians and 1 Corinthians. Uh, the word deeds of the flesh are these, and then he lists them. And one of those is outbursts of wrath or anger. And he says, I've told you before and I tell you again, if you practice this, practice these things, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. And so uh, I would lovingly share those scriptures with your husband. Uh, the Galatians 5 passage, 1 Corinthians 6, this is what scripture says, honey. I'm very concerned about your anger, your resentment. Uh, there could be other things going on with that. There's a lot of reasons for anger. Um, I won't get into those right now, but there could be underlying reasons why that's going on. Uh, I'm a single woman who's currently dating. My boyfriend and I have boundaries in place, such as not being alone together. What advice do you give for dating, dates in public places, restaurants, etc.? cetera? Um, we didn't allow our children to go out alone together. I think that's very wise. If they were in our home or the other person's home, we always ask that they would go in a you know, den or something, but not in a closed door space. Um, so I would just say, you know, I know a lot of people now, uh, which I really think is great. They make a covenant not to even hold hands, not to do anything uh, until they get married. So you just don't want to put yourself into any temptation where you would be tempted above that you're able, right? And so I would definitely set up parameters. So I think it's very wise what you're already doing. And talk to your boyfriend about that before you even get too far along in the dating process. So... Um, I know both of my children, they uh, didn't kiss their spouses till the wedding day. So that was the first time for both of them. So, um, you know, I think that's a good, I wish I could say I, have, I did that, but I didn't. So um, conference theme, walking with wisdom, keeping this in mind. What are your, wait a minute. Okay, conference theme, walking with wisdom. Keeping this in mind, what? Okay, keeping this something. What are your hands, godly suggestions for dating? Okay, I just gave some of those. Okay, and I already answered that question, and that is the end. Look, we got five minutes left. All right, well, thank you. So you're going to come up and... <laughs> All right, thank you girls so much.